they said he must give up being an evangelical Christian. He said he could not do this thing. They told him he must never pray. He just looked at him. How could he stop praying? They said there would be more trouble if he continued to talk to prisoners about Jesus. They said he would be tortured if he continued to read the scraps of a Bible that has been smuggled into the prison. They said it was the book that was the cause of all his troubles. They told him, give it up. Give up this dangerous thing. It doesn't look all that dangerous, but Isaac, that prisoner we've just seen, would disagree with you. And not just him, literally thousands in his own country of Eritrea and many more throughout the world find the act of reading this book full of danger. For those Christians, what you're about to see would be considered a miracle. Watch. Nobody is calling the police. I'm not being harassed. The owner hasn't asked me to leave, and I'm not the slightest bit worried about being imprisoned, tortured, or killed for reading my Bible. Being able to read my Bible here doesn't seem like a miracle today, but it would have been in the 16th century. In those days, only priests were allowed to read the Holy Scriptures. Others could listen, but they couldn't read it. And a man called William Tyndale changed all that. Tyndale believed everyone should be allowed to read the Bible. He left his home, fled to Germany, translated the Bible into English and printed 6,000 copies. These were the first Bibles ever printed in English and Tyndale had to smuggle them into Britain. His sworn enemy, the Bishop of London, actually ordered the entire printing, planning to burn all of them. Tyndall's response was to say, Oh, he will burn them? Well, I am the gladder, for I shall get the money from these books, and the whole world shall cry out upon the burning of God's word. Tyndall never lived to see the Bible freely available in his homeland. His final prayer as he was strangled and burned for his actions was, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. His prayer was answered. Today, evidence of the Bible's impact can be found throughout Western society. There's nothing unusual about its public display. It's so common, in fact, that it often blends into the background of everyday life. But this is a miracle. The Bible is readily available to us. Anyone can pick one up and read it without fear. What would Isaac of Eritrea give to enjoy this freedom? But do we make the most of our freedom? Do we rejoice in it? Do we exploit it by reading this book and living by it? Wouldn't it be a terrible thing if those who were banned from reading the Bible made a better job of living by it than those who were free to read it? An old Chinese pastor once said to me, there are only three types of Christian in the world and only one of them counts. One type has a Bible but doesn't read it. They don't count. Another type has a Bible, reads it, but doesn't love it. They don't count either. But one type has a Bible, reads it, and loves it. They change the world. Then a little tear sprang from his eyes, he said. But those kinds of Christians are very rare. What happens then when we have a Bible, read it, and love it? We need to talk to someone who's done all three and changed the world. His name? His brother Andrew. In 1955, he was gripped by a phrase from the book of Revelation, awake and strengthen what remains and is about to die. 
He saw the struggle of persecuted Christians in Eastern Europe and he answered God's call to do something no other Western Christian had done until that moment. Smuggle the Bible behind the Iron Curtain. Piling Bibles into the small Volkswagen Beetle, Andrew drove up to the border whispering a simple, now famous prayer. Lord, you made blind eyes see, please make seeing eyes blind. God answered his prayer, and Brother Andrew became known the world over as God's smuggler. Brother Andrew. People in power still find the book very subversive, very dangerous. Why are they so frightened of the Bible? Because the Bible makes a new man of you. And, and all the prevailing systems, religious or political, uh, they fear the moment when God steps into anybody's life because now we deal with another king of which the Apostle Peter said in Acts we have to obey God rather than men. Now suddenly the, the people in power lose control of the people of the book. We only through that dangerous book become people with our own opinion with conviction so strong that nothing can shake it but always based on love, always on compassion and always under the direct command of God. What about Christians who are not living then in totalitarian regimes? Is there a sense in which the Bible is a dangerous book, even if we're living in a free society? Yeah, and that's why the attack on us Christians in relation to reading the Bible is the method is different, the effect is the same. We are too busy to read the whole Bible. Uh, we live on some uh, excerpt some selected passages or verses you've got to become people by the book read the whole book as a book at least once a year absolutely it's too much you're too lazy and how can you expect god to bless you mm. use you protect you if you're too lazy even to read his book for which thousands of people have given their lives the prophets were killed for it mm -hmm. the apostles were killed for it the martyrs throughout church history have been killed for it Today people are killed for it, and we just put it on the shelf. Like there's this story uh, about a family in Holland where I live, and, and the little boy in the family found the family Bible, and it was covered with dust. So he took it to his mother, he said, Mother, is, is this God's book? Mother looked at the Bible and said, sure, this is God's book. He said, well, why don't we send it back, because we don't use it. People would want to, to walk that walk that you've walked. So give them one thing that they can get started in order to live by the book. What would you say that should be? One of my prayers still is, God make me real. My advice would be, when you read the word, God speak to me and, and, and whatever you tell me, I, I will do it. And then, and then a whole life of adventure starts that, that will scare you. God will put you to the test. If he doesn't, I would feel scared. If you've never been shot at by the devil, it would scare me. Then I think, uh-uh, am I not worth a shot? So you're asking for problems when you follow Jesus radically, but in it you say, hallelujah, I'm on the right track. Do the book, do it. Do the book. That changes your life. And that's where the danger element comes in. And why we need the persecuted church to show us the way. During the Cold War, I met a farmer in Czechoslovakia who'd never seen a Bible. He'd preached for 20 years from 10 chapters of Acts and four from 1 Timothy, hand copied by his mother. Those few pages were all the Bible he'd ever had. When I gave him an entire Bible for the first time in his life, he was in shock. He said to me, now I'm going to be in a lot more trouble. Thank you for bringing me the world's most dangerous book. Then he turned to me and asked, you've had this book for some time. Tell me, 
what wonderful trouble has it brought you? What a question. It went straight to my heart. What wonderful trouble has the Bible brought you? Is it really supposed to bring everyone trouble? Have I really found the Bible to bring me danger? Or is that just a call for the Brother Andrews of this world and that Czech pastor? It all sounds very Cold War. And the fact is, it isn't that easy to love this book. Many of us go through periods, perhaps inevitably, when we find the Bible rather tough going, boring some might even say. Oh, we revere the book, but we don't read it much. And we're uneasy even admitting this. But in places where Christians are not allowed to have a Bible, places where people put their very lives at risk to follow Jesus, the Bible has an incredible value. Encountering their story might change the way we encounter our Bible. Crammed into containers just like this one are hundreds of Christians in Eritrea today. What terrible things have they done to literally cook to death in these metal ovens without trial, without adequate food and water. Their crime is to be Christians and do the things that Christians do like praying, fellowshipping and reading their Bibles. My brother Gideon understands this very well. Isaac's commander used to say he wouldn't trade Isaac for 10 other soldiers. He was a fierce killer, smart and brave. Isaac was also a man for drink and a man who went for the women. He was in a war, surviving the best he could. He was disrespectful to the officers, but they let it go because they wanted him to fight. Isaac's unit of 500 men, 450 died in one battle. Most of the survivors were seriously wounded. Isaac was unhurt. Two Christian soldiers came to him and said, You have been spared for a purpose. God must have a plan for you, or you would have been dead too. Isaac opened his heart and made a decision to follow Jesus. From that moment on, he stopped his bad habits. He showed respect to his officers and everyone saw that something was different about Isaac. His commander saw the changes too. He was furious. He told Isaac, you have lost your killer instinct. I would rather have you insubordinate and stupid than a Christian. You could have been a great soldier. Isaac was told to stay away from the Christians. He was told to not read the Bible. When the Christians gave him a Bible, they told him, don't just read it, eat the words of God, take them deep inside. Mm -hmm. 
Isaac was very careful not to let anyone see him reading his Bible. But they caught him. After days in the sun, they asked if he would stop reading the Bible. He said, No, I cannot. The tortures increased. They tied him and kept him in the helicopter position for seven long days. Amanda asked if he was now ready to give up reading the book. Still, Isaac would not agree to stop reading the Bible. The commander threw him in a container with many other prisoners. It was so crowded, they had to take turns sleeping. In the day, it was terribly hot. At night, it was so cold, everyone would just shiver. They offered him an end to his suffering and a military promotion. They wanted him to agree to not read the Bible, not talk to Christians, not talk about Jesus, and not pray. For nine long months, Isaac did not sign. He did not break. He did not fall. In 2004, the commander gave up. Isaac was sent to prison in the capital, Asmara. He is there today. Isaac is just 26 years old. He has never known a day without persecution. No one may ever hear Isaac's name outside Eritrea. But in prison, he is a legend. Even new believers lined up to get pieces of his Bible. He would tell them, eat this book, it will get you in trouble, but it is all worth it. We've come a long way since William Tyndale died to smuggle Bibles into England. Persecution for reading the Bible is part of our ancient past. But Isaac's experience opens my eyes to the incredible freedom I have, freedom Isaac may never enjoy. I don't know about you, but the reality of Isaac, suffering in a prison in Eritrea, rocks my comfortable world. It changes how I view my Bible, and it changes the seriousness of my commitment. There's suffering in these pages. Blood was shed and is being shed so Christians can read this book. Remembering that changes everything. This is my Isaac covenant. Isaac has committed never to sign the paper saying he won't read the Bible. I am committing myself to reading my Bible differently. One, I will rejoice in the freedom I have to open this book and read it without fear. I won't take that for granted anymore. I'll fight to keep that freedom too, and fight for justice for those like Isaac who are without the freedom I have. Two, I will remember my persecuted ancestors, who, like Tyndale, 
gave their blood to put this book into my hands. Every Western country has a Tyndale in their past. I will remember to pray for persecuted Christians who are right now giving their blood to bring the truth of the Bible to their people and their countries. Three, I will be radical in my commitment to read and obey this book. Brother Andrew said, go through the book and let the book go through you. Do the book. Stand for justice, love mercy, serve God. And I may just get into trouble, the best kind of trouble. Trouble for the cause of Christ. I'll never look at this book the same way again. Is it dangerous? That depends. It's safe on the table. It's safe on my shelf. But when I open it and read it, I'm challenged. I have to get honest with myself, with my motives. God asks, will you do my book? If I say, yes, I'll be changed. And that's dangerous. It means a real life change. And the more I read, the more God will ask me to follow him. And the more trouble I'll get into. But along the way, there's great joy from trusting and living a dangerous life for God. It's a powerful lesson from Isaac, a prisoner for Jesus Christ in faraway Eritrea. Do the book. Do the dangerous book. <laughs>